Directly, the Taliban took over here. They banned football, chess, and the flying of kites. Their vehicles patrol the streets constantly. Women must either stay indoors, or if they appear in public, they have to wear the burqa, which covers everything, even the face. There was a tremendous stir in Kandahar. We followed the crowds to a mosque in the city center. The Taliban had been holding an assembly of mullahs from all over Afghanistan. Now the results were about to be made public. A holy war was announced against the government of President Rabbani in Kabul. And the head of the Taliban, Mullah Omar, was declared to be the Amir or leader of all Muslims everywhere. Because this was regarded as a key moment for the Afghan nation, Mullah Omer displayed the holy cloak of the Prophet Muhammad to the crowd. It's kept in Kandahar and is shown only at times of crisis. The last time was 60 years ago. Neither the cloak nor the ceremony has ever been filmed before, nor has Mullah Omer. People in the crowd threw up their turbans to touch the cloak and be blessed by it. It was like being at some great religious ceremony in the Middle Ages. The Taliban have made Kandahar quieter and more law-abiding than it's been for years. They're cooperating with the Red Cross to build a new hospital. We went there to meet the Taliban health minister, Mullah Baluch, as he heard petitions. He's the one member of the Taliban ruling council here who'd agree to be interviewed on camera. That would seem to make him a liberal. But with the Taliban, liberal is a relative term. Mullah Baluch, as Minister of Health, likes to carry out the sentences of Islamic law himself. In other words, he cuts off the hands and feet of criminals. He's done it twice this year so far. These are two of the cases that recently came under his charge. Both men were convicted of theft, and they were punished in full accordance with the Sharia laws. Mullah Baluch feels that men like this are unlikely to re-offend. We punish criminals according to Sharia Islamic law. When someone steals or robs, that law decrees that his left hand or right foot should be amputated. If they commit the same crime again, then his right hand or left foot should also be removed, so he can't do it again. The amputations are carried out by doctors and surgeons. As Minister of Health, you support the notion that doctors should cut off the hands of people? We have no animosity with the people themselves. It's the Sharia that decrees we do it. So the Taliban have established here the society they were formed to create society in which Islamic law is given its full force. An eye for an eye. For a convicted murderer, there can only be one penalty. But is there more to the Taliban than this kind of rough justice? We headed westwards, out of Kandahar, to see how they governed some of the other parts of their new empire. The road westward out of the city may not be good, but it's the strategic key to the whole of this part of Central Asia. Whoever controls the road, controls the trade route from Pakistan to the republics of the former Soviet Union. It's exactly what the Pakistanis want. Last September, with Pakistan's encouragement, the Taliban pushed further and further along this road. They aren't, as it happens, very good fighters, but they are good at persuading the factions along their way to join forces with them. The embattled Afghan government in Kabul believes it was all done for Pakistan's benefit. Taliban was created by the Pakistani intelligence services and by its interior minister, General Barber, for their own purposes. Their leaders are puppets of Pakistan, even if the foot soldiers of their organization may be unaware of the links. I put that to General Barber, the Pakistani government minister who first encouraged the Taliban to start their campaign. We have got no favorites, we have had no favorites, and we have not been supportive of anyone in that manner. So it is purely the consumer goods, the telephone or some other facility that we are providing. But that does not in any manner sort of help them in their, their uh, 
uh, war with the central government, all things. Last September, the road took the Taliban to Herat, Afghanistan's second city. It was a huge prize, and they won it almost without firing a shot. But they'd reached alien territory now. The Taliban speak Pashto. Herat is a city of Persian speakers, civilized and sophisticated. The Taliban began imposing their fundamentalist ideas on it. They hacked off any representations of living creatures, just as they banned television pictures, because they're idolatrous. This fountain was designed by Herat's most famous artist. Local people were appalled. Women have usually been freer in Herat than elsewhere in Afghanistan. Now the Taliban ordered them to stay at home or cover themselves in the burqa, which is a traditional Pashto garment, nothing whatever to do with the Persian culture of Herat. They closed down the girls' schools and sent the women teachers home. The school's principal showed us around. Nothing had changed here since the day the Taliban had moved in, in some force, and ordered everyone out of the school. For the educated people of the city in particular, the arrival of the Taliban was the start of a nightmare which hasn't gone away. We could only find one woman who was prepared to speak out about it all. Normally, she'd never willingly have worn a burqa, but this was the only way of hiding her identity. Our life is bitter because we're not free. One day I went to the school and the door was closed. And they told me that women aren't allowed to come here anymore and should stay at home. It's not possible to learn anything or educate your children. They've been pressing us to wear the burqa. We are not allowed to show our faces to strangers. Many women hate the Taliban. We were invited to meet the Taliban governor as he held court. He was hospitable, but definitely a backwoodsman. We couldn't film him in close-up. Our audience with him began with a prayer. We want everyone in America to convert to Islam. We are inviting the King of America and the King of Russia to convert to Islam. I asked him about Taliban's control over Herat. God be praised, there is no one in Herat who opposes us. The people of Herat have promised us, some of them are sitting here and you can ask them, that they're not against us. But out in the streets we had clear evidence this wasn't true. As we parked in order to do some filming, a passerby threw a note into the vehicle. Our translator read it out. Dear BBC correspondent, I cannot mention my name in this letter for you because I'm afraid there is no right of saying anything because they are going to beat us and kill us. I want to uh, tell you to pass the message for all of the world and for Afghanistan people that we are not anymore human beings under the control of Taliban here in Herat. The atmosphere was very tense. The slightest incident, this traffic accident involving a Taliban driver, for instance, could blow up into something much bigger and more threatening. Only seven months after their triumphant entry into the city, the Taliban seemed like an army of occupation, bitterly resented. They've certainly gone a long way to achieving their original aim, the introduction of full Islamic law in Afghanistan. Beyond that, though, the men of Taliban have no real political ideas at all. They're still very powerful, and they certainly will have their part to play. But it's hard to think now that they can take over the country and run it on their own.